But over time, uh, what we observe with all these bubbles and with the stock market in general, it's opened up, it's democratized. And so more and more people are able to buy uh, shares in companies. Uh, and we see this, you know, particularly when you get to the 1890s, a lot of working class people putting their savings into the stock market. So bicycle companies, breweries. So there was like 300 plus breweries floated on the London Stock Exchange and other stock exchanges in the UK in the 1890s. Again, a lot of working class savers putting their money into uh, brewery shares. Wow. So they were investing in the pub and how they got home from the pub. Exactly. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. Before we get started, I just have a few short messages. First off, don't forget to like, share and subscribe this podcast. It's the best way to help us grow and help me get on bigger and better guests. Also, don't forget you can pre-order my book, To the Moon, The GameStop Saga, right now by following the links in the description below. We've also got a few quick sponsors for the show today. Comedy is a really crucial art form especially in a world where government power seems to be rapidly expanding. It's one of the most effective ways to speak truth to power. And to that end, today I bring you the Behind the Bits podcast with Scott Curtis, a podcast about the tragedy and triumph of stand-up comedy. Every week, Scott has a new comedian on the show to talk about inspiration for their comedy, the struggles of the industry, and how they find themselves stumbling into the world of comedy. In one of my favourite recent episodes, Scott spoke to Liz Meal, a New Jerseyite who began comedy at 16. The show can swing between hilariously funny and incredibly poignant at times. She spoke about realising the problems you had as a child in retrospect, smoking weed as a waitress, mental health, breaking rules and the wild roller coaster of performing on stage. You'll get behind the bits wherever you find your podcast. Apple, Spotify, and more. That's Behind the Bits with Scott Curtis, the best podcast to get to know the people behind the jokes. Cryptocurrencies are all the rage these days. Over 100 million people now own cryptocurrency. Some for the memes, some for the long-term value, and some for the underlying technology. But there hasn't been a coin or token that has emerged yet that truly replaces cash or currency. This is where Dash comes in. Dash is digital cash, a user-focused cryptocurrency which you can spend anywhere, anytime, and any amount for fees less than one cent. With hashtag Dash Direct, people can spend their Dash at over 155,000 major US retailers and get a discount and money back into their Dash wallet. No banks, no fiat, just pure crypto with an average saving of 5%. Anyone can participate in the network and Dash is widely available for purchase around the world. The ingenious masternode network means sending any sum of money around the world is as simple as tapping your phone at your local grocery store. So you can say goodbye to slow transactions, complex international account numbers and high transaction fees. Dash gives you the freedom to move your money any way you want. Grab a coffee, split a check or pay your phone bill. Dash moves money anywhere to anyone instantly for less than a cent. Links for everything will be in the description below. So check them out and then please enjoy the podcast. Just tell me when we're live. We're live. Lovely. Okay. So yeah. Um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today I am here with the authors of the Boom and Bust Cycle. Welcome to the show guys. William Quinn, John Turner. Thanks very much for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks very much for joining me. It's uh, yeah, exciting. Uh, like, like I said before we started, I, I I came across your book and then turned out you both work at Queens. I was like, well, that's very handy. <laughs> much easier than yeah, trying to get Zoom or something organized. It's nice to be able to speak to you in person. Um, so do you want to give people like a, a thesis of the book, like the elevator pitch or whatever, just before we we kick off, so they get like a, a frame of of what you guys have written about? Yeah, sure. So. Uh... We are financial historians. We're interested in, um, you know, 
how economies have changed over time and within that how it's been affected by financial institutions and financial markets and a feature of uh, financial markets and the point at which they start really visibly affecting the economy is whenever there's a crash when everything's go wrong a lot of the time finance comes along in the background um, and you only notice it whenever suddenly parts of it aren't there suddenly parts of it are feeling and everyone feels it in their pocket um, so what we do with the book is we look at the past 300 years of um, financial history and pick out times when there were financial bubbles so financial bubble we just defined to begin with as uh, a substantial rise in the price of a major asset followed by a substantial fall in the price of that asset and then we look into what causes it um, and we hone in on 10 episodes starting with what we call the first financial bubbles of 1720. Uh, the tulip mania was a little uh, a little bit earlier than that but we don't think it really counts uh, for various reasons um, so we start with 1720 and this was a, a series of financial bubbles driven by politics in uh, France, uh, the UK and to a lesser extent the Netherlands and coming all the way up to uh, China in 2015 when there was a, another major stock market bubble uh, and what we do is we draw on this 300 years of experience to uh, answer the question of what causes uh, financial bubbles. Um, and we came up with a model. Uh, the model is based off the fire triangle in chemistry. Are you familiar with the fire triangle? I think so. So the fire triangle is... Blair, do you want to pull it up? Um, if you can find it. The, the, the fire triangle is uh, sort of rudimentary. Are we wait for this? Or? No, no, go for it. Okay. So the, the fire triangle is a, like a GCSE level science metaphor. It it's, states that... Uh, a fire begins when you have three necessary conditions in place, followed by a spark. So the three necessary conditions for a fire are oxygen, heat, and fuel. If there's lots of oxygen, heat, and fuel, then a spark will set off a fire. With the bubble triangle, uh, we argue that uh, a bubble occurs when three necessary conditions are in place. First condition is marketability, uh, which is similar to liquidity. It's the ability to... Uh, buy and sell a particular asset. If an asset's too difficult or impossible to buy and sell, it's unlikely to experience a bubble. The, the other, the, the second necessary element, the fuel uh, for the bubble, comes from uh, money or credit. So if there's a lot of savings floating about the economy, if it's very easy to borrow money, um, if uh, people are looking to invest and they have a lot of money to invest, uh, you're more likely to get a bubble. This is the fuel. This is what drives prices up. Um, and then the third element was speculation. So this is where people are buying assets because the price is expected to rise uh, rather than because they want the asset as consumption good or because they think the company is going to make a lot of money. Uh, this is where they think the price is rising. So they buy in the hopes of selling at a profit in the near future. So those are our three necessary elements. And once those are in place, you need a spark. Um, and we argue that the spark can come from one of two places. It can come from politics, so uh, a government policy that uh, encourages prices to rise in a particular asset. Maybe this is to enrich a particularly uh, important group to the government. Um, maybe there are other reasons they want to do this. Um, but this is one of the sparks that can start a bubble. And the other spark is technological. So a new technology, uh, people are very excited by it. Maybe there are very high profits for early adopters. Um, there's a lot of money flowing into it, a lot of new companies uh, setting up. Uh, and this attracts a lot of money in the hope of uh, earning a very quick profit. Um, so that's our model. But this is what we believe causes financial bubbles. Okay. So in all the examples you looked at, there was these three these three uh, criteria plus a spark. Yes. Um, so I guess like the first thing that I, I'm curious of is, is like, and the reason I asked you guys on mainly is like, oh, 
do you see those conditions replicating themselves at the moment? Is that is that subtle? Because to me, okay, it looks like we've got a lot of credit or money flowing around. We've printed a lot of money in the last um, 18 months. I think in America, uh, for example, there's, I think, like two thirds of all dollars in circulation have been printed in the last 18 months, which is just bonkers. <laughs> um, the, but do, yeah, do you see the, the other um, the other uh, criteria there that you've laid out being being present? Yeah, so so if we look at today and what's been going on in the past two years, uh, those three sides of the bubble triangle are, are all there. So as you mentioned, the uh, the fuel is there because we've got super low interest rates. In fact, interest rates can't really go any lower. And this actually causes investors to do something called reaching for yield. So they're, uh, there's a, an economist, uh, well, uh, uh, he was the editor of The Economist magazine back in the 19th century called Walter Beget. And Beget has this very famous saying, John Bull, which is a representation of the English investor, can withstand many things, but he can't withstand 2%. In other words, when interest rates drop to 2%, investors start investing in riskier assets. And because interest rates today are so low, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing investors reaching into those riskier assets. Uh, but there's also margin lending today on a scale for retail investors that I don't think that we've seen before. So a lot of retail investors are uh, borrowing to buy shares, but also borrowing to buy cryptocurrency and crypto assets. Uh, so that's the first side. The other side is the marketability side. And there's two features we think that we see this increase in marketability uh, today. So the first is uh, the development of crypto exchanges. Okay, so Coinbase being an obvious example where you can buy and sell crypto assets. So retail investors can step in and, and buy and sell these assets. But we also have the development of uh, these new trading apps such as Robinhood, mm -hmm. which basically zero commission. Uh, it's, it encourages people to trade because that's how Robinhood make their, make their money because the more people trade, the more information they can pass on to the market about those trades. Mm. Uh, and that's stimulated. So that's the marketability side. And then on the speculation side, uh, across the world, you have a lot of millennials who are sitting at home, still getting their paycheck, uh, and they've nothing to spend their money on. And all of a sudden, there's also no sports and television. They can't gamble in the same way on sports contests that they would normally do. And so what do they start doing? They start speculating on the stock exchange. So this is happening in, in, in the UK. It's happening in Ireland. It's happening in the United States. It's, it's happening in India. And it's also happening in, in, in China. So that we see those three sides uh, present today in the, in the environment that we're living in. Mm. I just want to stop, Blair. Will you turn the the volume down just a little bit on the headphones because I could, we can hear the we can hear it like yeah the echo on it a little bit. Um, so yeah, the the thing that I would I would actually like push back a tiny bit on that is that I don't actually think it's just what you've said with the this like massive rise in retail investors. The thing that I find or I I at least believe is that it's a whole bunch of people who maybe haven't been able to build wealth in the traditional ways like it's, it's much har harder to go out and buy a house um or and, and traditional investing as like a long-term way to you know secure your future hasn't hasn't materialized for millennials and zoomers in the way it perhaps did for gen xers and boomers and um what was it the greatest generation <laughs> yeah they really did a marketing job on that one <laughs> you call yourself the greatest generation um but the i find like it's it's almost like a it's like well we're never we are only going to build like generational wealth through like crazy speculation basically <laughs> i think it's but like it's almost like a well maybe we'll get rich off this this is our best shot because the other way is so difficult which is yeah so, so, so yeah this is this is something we see in every single bubble that we that we look at so people come into the bubble novices to investing and they are trying to get wealthy mm -hmm. and so this democratization if you like of, of speculation it happens across all of these bubbles and it's certainly happening today. So people hoping, you know, as you say, they can't afford to buy a house, can't get the property ladder. So maybe one of the ways they can accelerate that is to start investing in crypto. And when, you know, crypto returns have been going up, what, 600, 700% on Bitcoin over the past, uh, you know, 20 months, you know. Uh, if you've managed to get in before this all happened, and if you manage to sell, then you may become very wealthy. Mm. 
yeah, I have a friend who's sitting on like Bitcoin, like an a Bitcoin. I found that out recently. I was like, whoa, okay, fair play, man. Like you, you were in early. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely agree with your point there. I've heard a sociologist say that um, of all the societies they've studied, that the one thing or one of the things that everyone has in common is that people are always looking to get ahead. And if you're in your 20s today, there aren't many ways that you can get ahead. And uh, this makes sense to me that you're drawn into these types of um, highly speculative investment because, as you say, there aren't many other options. It's um, You could argue that it's a sign of a stagnant economy or an economy that provides not so many opportunities to, to young people. Um, but it's difficult to prove. Yeah. People are greedy, whether they have other opportunities or not. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can get, yeah. I think it's also people People like this idea of like breaking the financial system or moving beyond traditional money. And that plus the fact there's like this new tech plus the, you know, fact that there's been cases of people making a lot of money. It makes, it makes it all very attractive to people. It's just a very, very powerful narrative, mm. um, which is... So you know, something that we do see a lot uh, during the book is that these narratives crop up, but yeah, it's it's only since the, the crypto bubble that I've really appreciated the power of that, just having a good story. Mm. Um, it, it is a good meme as well. A good meme, mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um one of the things that I, I remember like I've seen I've seen like argued uh, by a lot of people uh, maybe more so on the like the left of, of economics who would say you know this um constant boom and bust cycle is not inevitable it's just like a function of the way our markets are set up but what you're saying is that or at least what it seems you're saying is that if you go back 300 years to 1720 or 301 years or that um we have we see like the, the same basic uh, underlying factors causing uh, like a like bubbles and, and that boom and bust cycle like, do you think that's just kind of like an inevitable thing are, are bubbles just human nature in a way do you know, like people people love to jump on a good bandwagon mm. um, you know people love the idea of getting rich quick without having to do much it's like that kind of like secret knowledge that people enjoy like is uh, is this cycle an inevitable thing so um, the boom and bust cycle and the existence of financial bubbles are slightly different um, think about a cycle people sometimes talk about a cycle like the business cycle but it doesn't have a fixed length Whenever a cycle doesn't have a fixed length, all you're really saying is that sometimes the economy is growing and sometimes the economy is shrinking. The economy grows whenever people come up with new technology or uh, people increase their working hours, and then it shrinks, usually due to an external shock like a new disease. Um, and to me, that just seems inevitable. That it, it's you know to, to say. To defeat the business cycle, you would need to defeat like hurricanes, volcanoes, earthquakes, just all kinds of natural disasters, because that's the type of thing that causes the economy to shrink. So to sort of say that we can prevent that from happening, I don't think is true. Um, financial bubbles are a little bit different from the boom and bust cycle. Uh, one of the, the, the arguments that we make throughout the book is that bubbles aren't this sort of naturally occurring fact of nature. What people don't realize is that between 1929 with the Wall Street crash and the Japanese bubble during the 1980s, we had almost no major financial bubbles. And the reason for that is that um, finance was more repressed. There was a lid on it. It was, if you like, controlling the marketability side uh, of the bubble triangle. Um, and when we started seeing financial bubbles come up again was with the, the financial liberalization of the Reagan and Thatcher era. Um, so bubbles happen for a reason. They happen, as we say, because of a spark, a government policy, loose monetary policy, um, speculation. And when these things aren't in place, bubbles don't really happen or they happen in a much smaller scale. You have maybe a, a bubble in comic books or in uh, Beanie Babies, that these things that don't affect the overall economy, but these large scale housing and stock market bubbles, they happen for a reason that they, they're not, um, 
purely cyclical, if that means anything. Yeah, yeah. So what you're saying is basically like the the ebb and flow of like businesses becoming successful and sort of, you know, then fading away through like, I don't know, technological advancement or no one likes them anymore, or they just do a bad job or, um, you know, they're poorly managed, that that, that's not inevitable, but what is inevitable, or sorry, that that is inevitable, but the, the, uh, like extreme bubbles that sort of come from speculation, um, or loose regulation is something that is not so do you, why do you think it is then between 1929 and the the 1980s that there wasn't that like is it is it just regulation where people were the you know put things put in place after 29 that people were like well you know we can't let this happen again and then sort of slowly those were untangled so, so, so it wasn't so much 29 that triggered it but the great depression in the of the early 30s that triggers you know financial regulation well, and years. you know regulation of banks and this stops banks uh, essentially lending too much to risky borrowers. And that regulation is applied across the world. Uh, so all of a sudden, the fuel for... So is it like an international... Um, uh, to to totally. Uh, so so w once you get to the 1930s, this is you've got an international monetary system. Uh, you've got uh, an international uh, regulatory system. Uh, okay, different countries applied it in diff slightly different ways, but they all... Uh, what's called repress their financial systems uh, you know and they did it for a variety of reasons uh, you know to help fund governments and to, to channel money into the, the 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 government bond markets you force banks and insurance companies and others to buy government bonds that means they can't lend to people wanting to buy their homes for example and so they they're not doing these sort of risky types of loans okay so then what sort of yeah more broadly, like what are they trying to stop when they're making this regulation? Like, what are the things they're putting the brakes on? So, so they're they're preventing companies. So, some really uh, specific examples here. So, in the UK, for example, uh, you couldn't le lend to people who were speculating on, on, on property. Uh, so, and, and we know property markets are, are very dangerous because when they collapse, banks collapse. Mm. So, if you actually stop banks lending to property developers in the first place. Uh, also stopped uh, banks lending uh, to other speculative parts of the economy. Uh, they would have required banks to hold uh, a lot of their assets in the form of, of, of cash and very safe short-term government bonds. Uh, so, so basically banks weren't taking a lot of risk. They were being, in effect, told what to do with the, the deposits they were raising. You also had a lot of capital controls. So a major feature of the bubbles from 1980 onwards is money from all over the world flowing into a particular asset and then like flowing out again almost as, as quickly as it arrived. So you look at the bubbles in um, Southeast Asia in the 1990s, this was sort of classic emerging economy bubbles. Hmm. Money flows in and pumps prices up and then money flows out again. Between you know the 1930s and the 1980s or maybe through the sort of the mid 1970s, it sort of gradually eroded. Money couldn't cross borders very easily, so this type of thing didn't happen. Okay, yeah, that's one of the things that I, I was really shocked actually to learn was that before the the big bang, basically with with Thatcher's sort of deregulation, that um, this was a thing that that like you couldn't move money outside of the the country very easily I mean, which is like completely inconceivable to me in in 2021 it's like what do you mean i can't move money out of the country like this <laughs> do you think that, that it's a realistic thing to even suggest that we could reimpose those in the modern world or is that just gone with well, the internet because having erased so many borders well china does it china still has capital controls um, not, not many countries ha are as powerful, have as much state capacity as China, mm. but you know, if you want to do it and, and you have the power to do it, it, it is still an option. Um, some countries still try and fail, uh, but yeah, China is mm. one of the world's biggest economies and it does it, so yeah, they're still with us. Okay. Um, so basically then the next thing I want to ask about is the, is the what causes the bubbles so what leads to that that situation? So we've talked about the, the marketability credit and, and speculation, um, but 
I, I want to get like more specifically into then what what that leads to that means that like prices inflate out of control. So yeah, how, how does how does that happen? Like how do these the three factors the the marketability, the the credit um, or money, and the speculation then sort of lead to the yeah prices becoming so inflated? So this is. Okay, so first of all, you need the spark, and what the spark does, let's say a new technology, let's talk about one of the, I suppose, the, 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 the examples in the book, the, the bicycle mania of the 1890s. Okay. So you get this new technology emerging, uh, so ball bearings, pneumatic tires, uh, the wellless tubes, and you get these technologies merging to form the modern bicycle. Okay, that then gets people excited about this new technology. And uh, companies are beginning to set up, and all these investors are seeing this new technology, and they're buying shares in these companies as they float in the stock exchange. And it's relatively easy to do so now because there's been changes to the, uh, if you like, the, the regulation in the stock exchange, which allows companies to issue one pound shares, even less. Uh, so that brings speculation, it sort of democratizes it, brings it into the realm of you know, the, the working classes, working around Birmingham, working around Manchester, outside London. Uh, and then interest rates in this period are super low, so people aren't getting a great return in their bank accounts or on their, their, their government bonds. So they're looking to the stock market and they begin investing in, in speculative assets. So one of the speculative assets they invest in is, is then uh, bicycles. And so uh, people start buying these shares and other people observe people buying these shares and doing well. They, they, they read the local newspapers and they see the price of such and such a company has gone up. And then they go out and they keep buying and they keep buying. And that, that's what really drives up sort of narrative, the, you know, oh, you know, I've got this share and it's doubled in price over the past two weeks. That's, that's the sort of narrative that's then driving uh, the prices upwards. Mm. So the, it, you said the 1890s. Yeah. That's fascinating. You wouldn't have imagined that people, like, the, we, the, people would have had the, the capital or the ability to invest, like more than just say like the the aristocracy at that point to invest in in anything. So was that like a like a practice that was going on? Were they like the 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 eighteen nineties versions of like the crypto punks? So so, so what so, so what what you observe actually over over time is that uh, initially the first bubble we look at it's it's the elite that are buying. Uh, the shares of companies because you know it's a hundred pounds a pop, if not more. Uh, you know you have to be super wealthy. But over time, uh, what we observe with all these bubbles and with the stock market in general, it's opened up, it's democratised, and so more and more people are able to buy uh, shares in companies. Uh, and we see this, you know, particularly when you get to the 1890s, a lot of working class people putting their savings into the stock market. So. Bicycle companies, breweries. So there was like 300 plus breweries floated on the London Stock Exchange and other stock exchanges in the UK in the 1890s. Again, a lot of working class savers putting their money into uh, brewery shares. Wow. So they were investing in the pub and how they got home from the pub. Exactly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Running any form of YouTube show or podcast can be really difficult at times. There is so much to keep up to date with, new platforms, SEO tricks, trends, and a whole host of new ways to market your show. Thankfully for all of us overwhelmed creators out there, there is now a solution. Podcast Movement's daily newsletter. In the last few weeks alone, I've learned an amazing amount of stuff. They offered some fantastic podcast SEO tricks, gave me the heads up on YouTube's new subtitle editor, and recommended a free and amazingly detailed analytics tool for my podcast. The Podmove Daily is a free daily newsletter that is geared towards anyone who's a podcaster looking to get into podcasting or in the podcast industry. It goes out every morning at 11.15 Eastern, featuring fresh news, curated resources, industry announcements, and more. It's the best rundown of everything happening in the podcast world right now. And you can check out all of the most recent issues by going to podcastmovement.com forward slash today's issue. And best of all, they've created a special landing page just for listeners and viewers of this show. You can go to podcastmovement.com forward slash chatter. That's podcastmovement.com forward slash chatter to check out their personalized page just for us. So if you want to be up to date on what is happening in the podcast world, and get the best tips and tickets to keep your show growing, subscribe to the Podmove Daily Podcast from Podcast Movement. You won't be disappointed. 
No, I mean, I, that's solid investments, really. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm curious to like go back to the the, the bubble in, in 1720, and maybe we talk a little bit about the the the, the tulip bubble that you mentioned in, in Holland. But uh, is, was the 1720s one the South Sea bubble, um, or was that something else? So there were really two major bubbles, uh, the Mississippi bubble in France and the South Sea bubble in, seven, in uh, the UK, uh, both in 17... So the Mississippi bubble sort of began a little bit earlier, uh, but they both came to your head in 1720. Okay. So, so yeah, so what were, what happened with the first bubble? Because, I mean, is this was this like the first time in history we'd seen people, yeah, running away on speculation? And was is this the first time that people maybe ever had enough disposable income to even like jump into that sort of thing? So before that, we had the, the tulip mania. Um, now, the, the tulip mania is very famous, uh, but the, there's um, an author, Anne Goldgar, who's sort of written about it and basically shows that it was much, much smaller than people realize. Um, very similar to Beanie Babies. So, like, the Beanie Baby bubble is one that we don't write about because it's not economically interesting. It doesn't have an effect on normal people the way that the 2000s housing bubble did. Um, and tulips were like this. So uh, tulips for a brief period become um, objects of speculation. So people buy the bulbs in the hope of selling them whenever the price of the bulbs go up. Uh, and some people became very excited about this. But there was no spike in bankruptcies. We, we didn't see people you know, betting the house and becoming ruined. Uh, a lot of the evidence that was used to establish the narrative of the tulip mania was uh, based on... Uh, satirical articles that were then mistaken for um, facts by um, 19th century historians. That's amazing. So, it's just uh, the 21st century. <laughs> right. Um, so, tulip mania essentially just wasn't a very significant event. Um, what we call the first financial bubble, really, it's the first major financial bubble. Um, began in 1720, uh, or rather culminated in 1720, and it was deliberately created. That chapter in the book is called The Invention of the Bubble, because we, uh, once we've established this is the first financial bubble that we know of, it was so deliberately created that you would have to say the bubble was invented. And the guy who invented it was a genius Scottish financial theorist called John Law. Um, John Law uh, was sentenced to death in Scotland for um, killing someone in a duel, but he escaped from prison and fled to Italy. And he moved around Western Europe uh, for the next 10 years, uh, gambling and setting up various schemes and uh, using his understanding of probability theory and finance and human nature uh, to become very powerful and wealthy and high profile. And long story short, he ends up controlling the entire French economy. Um, the, the French government at this time is very deeply in debt and very worried about borrowing costs uh, that at that time was an existential threat because if you can't borrow, you can't finance a war if you're invaded. Uh, so in their panic, they turn to this... Um, runaway Scottish financial theorist uh, and uh, he ends up setting up what was really a precursor to the first central bank um, and this is connected to his Mississippi company uh, and his idea is to um, get everyone to invest in his Mississippi company um, fuel this with uh, fuel this by printing money so at the time uh, currency was in uh, metal coins and it had to have a certain amount of gold content John Law introduced paper money, and he also did this in the form of fractional reserve banking, where um, he was issuing you know, more notes than the government-controlled bank uh, had coins with which to redeem them. And then he was using this to inflate the price of the Missis Mississippi Company. Um, the idea was that he would be able to um, use control of monetary policy to grow the French economy fast enough uh, to keep up. Um, 
And again, long story short, it doesn't work. Uh, he loses the confidence of the French public, then the French government. Uh, the price of his Mississippi sh uh, shares collapses uh, and the whole scheme falls apart. Um, so this was the invention of the book. And this was an economic disaster. It really uh, destroyed the French economy and set its financial development back by a century. Um, the South Sea bubble, I won't get into. It's the, the British version, which is much more successful. Uh, they, they actually use it to successfully um, solve the issue of the government debt. Um, and it doesn't ruin their economy. So some historians have linked the uh, defeat of Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo, which is 80 years later, uh, back to 1720, and the fact that Britain solved its debt problem and was able to borrow whenever it wanted to fight a war, uh, whereas France didn't. Okay, so um, that's fascinating. So was that, that, that was the first time that they, we'd had fractional reserve banking? No, we'd had fractional reserve banking before that. Okay. Uh, so he, he, he didn't invent fractional reserve banking, but he, he took it to new levels, uh, let's say. Okay. Um, and it, it uh, so many of the things you said there, it, it amuses me so much that people think that we're in this brave new world where, you know, humans are completely different to what they were before. So you're talking about like people believing joke articles online, <laughs> like massive money printing, like, like just uh, charlatans running out, like just running an economy into the ground to try out their new theories. It's just like, how many times have we repeated this? <laughs> it cracks me up so much when yeah, humans just make the same mistakes again and again and again in just new and inventively destructive ways. So, so, so a, a couple of other amusing sort of tales of, of satire from a, a bubble in the 1820s that then passes into uh, people's reality and they think that these, actually, these companies actually uh, ha happened and existed. So one company was uh, recovering the, the, the cannonballs from major uh, sort of skirmishes in the North Sea uh, and reprocessing the iron. Uh, so that was one company. Uh, the other company was a company to look for the, the wealth of the Egyptians that had drowned in the Red Sea. Uh, so these are satirical companies that are set up. Uh, and it's just it's pure satire. But then in the later press and later reporting, uh, people actually refer to these as, as if they, these companies actually uh, existed. <laughs> so there was people claiming that they uh, they could be they were go they were going to invest money in in reclaiming cannonballs from the bottom of the sea and like finding gold in the Nile. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> oh, but it, it's a fact then that this passed down and people actually believed that these companies existed. So when later bubbles happen, the journalists of the time were referring back to these crazy companies that were established, even though that was pure satire. Mm -hmm. But are we sounding all right there? Are you just checking the things? Yeah. Okay. Lovely. All good. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I'll edit that out. Like we never did that. <laughs> That's the group. Yeah, we're not live, so it's all good. <laughs> the magic of editing will smooth it all out. Um, but that's fascinating that, that there was just things that have been mistaken for real companies. Like, because I, I, you said that, and I was just like, how would you even claim that you were going to the bottom of the sea? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, so one of the other things that that I wanted to ask about so. so um, obviously, we've talked a lot about how um, how bubbles arise, how speculation can get out of control, how um, financial markets can have quite a lot of impact upon people's real lives, but they maybe don't realise what they're doing until um, yeah, until the, there is a problem, basically. But then, when I would have this uh, conversation with with some people, they would just be like, "Well, capitalism is the problem." It's like, do you, do you believe that that's the case? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a very broad criticism. Um, it's, yeah, um, I'm never sure exactly what people mean by that to say, like, capitalism is the problem. I tend to think more in specifics. So, um, all capitalism is, as I understand it, all capitalism is, it is a system of um, ownership. So, um, the... Uh, commodification of things or a system of private property maybe where um, you have people who own things and then the right to buy and sell that uh, with other people 
uh, I don't think there's been a, a, an alternative a system where, in human history even, where that was completely not true. Mm. It's always going to be a question of degrees. There's a, uh, you can become more capitalist, you move in the, the direction of the US where uh, things which are controlled by the government here are um, you know, left to the free market. And, or you can move in the direction of China where, where more things are controlled by the government. Um, but to sort of say that capitalism as a system can be destroyed doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, and also, uh, the devil is in the detail. Uh, you, you can move, you can become more capitalism in, in a way that's very successful and improves people's well-being by a lot. And you become can become less capitalist in a way that improves people's well-being by a lot. Uh, but these are these very broad questions, and you know, pe people who uh, work in economics don't spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, questions this big anymore because, um, you know, like, like I say, it's it's really about the specifics. Mm. I mean, I guess um, one thing I always laugh is about was the there's a there's a great Jordan Peterson quote and he's he's talking about people who just you know it's like well everything's messed up well it's just the entire system and it's like well that's convenient isn't it if the whole system is broken it, you know you don't have to you know do any work to figure out something more specific that you can improve it's just the whole thing <laughs> it's quite it's quite a, I find it to be a, a both a lazy critique sometimes and I also feel like what a lot of people of my generation, when they say, oh, capitalism is the problem, they'll, they, what they mean is like the system that they have grown up in, which I believe has become like a really corrupted version of what like the golden age of consumer capitalism kind of gave us. It's like we had that great period from about 1945 ish to um about the 1980s when a lot of the the, the deregulation started under thatcher i think it's um mark e thomas the the economist he he's basically points at like that to be the turning point and i feel like when most people my age talk about capitalism as the problem i'm just like look we just we haven't seen a better like we haven't seen the system function in the way even close to how it was meant to and, and yeah so they get quite uh quite criti critical of like uh, the system completely. So I grew up in the 1970s. I, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I've heard this criticism as well a few times. And one of the things that, that Mark, Marky Thomas actually pointed out to me, because I said the same thing to him. I was like, look, people are always pointing at the 70s as a really bad period um, for economics. And I was laughing with my mom last night. It was just like, oh, you know, how does it feel to be back in the 70s? You know, you're always telling me how it was better. You're like, look, we've got fuel shortages. There's uh, inflation, you know, are threatening to go out of control. <laughs> um, but he had pointed out that if we saw the same growth, if we'd seen the same growth over the past 10 years um, that we'd seen during the 1970s, that like the economy would be theoretically in a healthier position uh, because it was uh, whilst a, quite a... Uh, a stagnated growth through the 70s it was far more um widely distributed across uh, across all sort of income groups rather than like the, the last 10 years of the almost all of the, the gains economically have gone to like the top 10 percent of the economy so so yeah this is what 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 has changed so the pie has got larger but how we distribute the economic pie has changed dramatically from the 1970s and this has happened across uh, the Western world. It's also happened, by the way, in, in, in China. So China has moved from being one of the most uh, equal societies in the 1970s, 1980s to being one of the world's least equal societies. You get the rise of these princelings, this new elite super class uh, of very wealthy individuals. So that, that's something that has changed since, since the 1970s, that how we distribute wealth has changed, but nevertheless, the pie uh, has, has improved. Okay. There's also a um, like a fundamental demographic political economy problem. So what we have in the UK now is a very large body of retired people uh, who all vote, who the vast majority of whom are, are homeowners and government policy in order to appeal to this group typically involves 
keeping house prices high, which is bad for young people who don't typically own their house, and increasing pensions every year while wage growth is stagnant. And this, to me, is the um, the defining feature of government policy today. It's everything they do um, is geared towards rewarding old people who vote, who um, particularly tend to vote conservative, um, at the expense of working classes and working middle classes who are the ones producing the wealth and keeping the economy running. Mm. So is that um, increase in inequality? Because that's that's not, I don't think that's that's like a specific trend to China. Like we've seen definitely an increase in inequality, at least I can speak to Britain and America. They're the two examples that I'm most like best, ver- the best versed in. Um, do you think that like increase in inequality would, will make bubbles worse and speculation worse is that is that like is that driving like the yeah that that cycle that i know i know we said that they weren't linked but um, in a way like the the so, bubbles lead to the crash um, so, so the, the the housing bubble of the 2000s uh one of the reasons that we we attribute uh to or one of the causes there is the fact that uh, governments in the United States, Spain, Ireland, the UK were uh, essentially not providing social housing to people uh, and they were trying to, to they realized that they had this inequality problem in their society and so they were making it easier for people uh, with new incomes, new jobs to borrow to buy houses. And so we tell the, the story in the book about lots of different people, whether they be in Spain, Ireland or the United States, who banks shouldn't have been lending to, but where? Because they were almost being forced, or their arm was certainly being twisted by the government to deal with a wider societal uh, problem. So there is this link between inequality and, and bubbles. And I certainly think it's there in China as well, because uh, you know the, the, the bubbles that we've observed in China over the past decade or so are driven by people who don't have very much money, uh, but are wanting to become like the, the, the elite middle class in, in, in China. Have you been paying attention to what's going on in the the Chinese real estate market with uh, Evergrande and stuff? Like, what's what's your take on that? Because I've been trying to get a handle on like how big this is and, and like what it might lead to. So, so one of the things you have to realize about the the, the Chinese banking system is that there's six major banks and they're all controlled by they're all owned by the state. Mm-hmm. You then have a bunch of smaller banks. Uh, so when the state own, owns the banks, they're not going to go bankrupt. They're not going to let those, those banks are not going to fail. Um, so, so that's on the one side. The other thing that's really interesting about China is that its growth is is really being driven by you know adopting all this Western technology and growing and growing, but they've been running out of growth. And to keep the people happy, they have to keep growing the economy. So how do you do that? Well, in Ireland, we, learnt, we learned that how did you help keep the Celtic Tiger going? Well, you started a, a housing boom. Mm. And so the same has been happening in China. They've just had this enormous housing boom. And all of this money has been directed into driving that, that housing boom, which is a you know, major, major consequences for, 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 for global supply chains and, and the cost of global materials. Um, and I've been in China several times. And you, you go through these cities, and we have no idea uh, until you go see it, the scale of, of urbanization in China. It's, it's, and it's just happened in the past 40 years. Mm, yeah. I mean, Blair, can you, can you see if you can find, there's, um, a great, there's a great like little, little video that shows like the, the urbanization of cities in China. Just see if you can pull it up. Cause it's really well, interesting so from like the 70s yeah, yeah. onwards. So Sh- Shenzhen, which is one of the largest cities in China, they estimated population 12 million back in the 1970s was tens of thousands. It was essentially a, a fishing village. And over, you know, over the last 50 years, it's become this mega city. Yeah. yeah it's absolutely bonkers how fast the Chinese economy has grown. And I mean, I guess, so one of the, the uh, of you, I don't know if either of you are familiar with uh, the work of Naomi Klein. So, so, okay. So um, in the shock doctrine, basically it, it's, is I think one of my favorite books. It's just, I think that one of the most stunning pieces of journalism, like it's, it's like 500 pages and like every single page is just like beautiful prose and bombshell after bombshell after like great piece of reporting. And, um, essentially it's like mapping the, the, the expansion of like Milton Friedman, like free market capitalism, um, into, 
many different economies around the world. So she plots it's like uh, it's like the most extreme version of it, like spreading out from like the Chicago uh, Chicago School of Economics into Latin America, Southeast Asia. Um, and then in, in parts of Europe, like the former Soviet states. And uh, she essentially says that th this, that the growth in China has been fueled by like trying to import like the, the ideas of the free market with ac without actually embodying that. Do, do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like they're trying to like take all, all those gains, but without actually having it being free in a way. Like, do, do you think that that leaves them open to even more chances for like bubbles to develop when there's sort of it's just like well the government says what's going to happen and then all the money goes there so so, so yeah the, the the government in china has engineered a lot of these bubbles deliberately engineered these bubbles to keep the stock market going to keep the economy going so there has been a lot of engineering of bubbles by by the, the chinese communist party hmm. but it's also the case that um politics is also a fundamental so there's engineering a bubble and there's deliberately elevating asset prices. How capable, how willing and capable is the Chinese government of keeping the price of real estate high? Um, that, that's an open question. Mm -hmm. Some people treat it as a given that it's not possible. They have this idea, well, it's popped up by the government, so it's bound to come down eventually. But that's not necessarily the case, especially with the government is powerful and unscrupulous is China. If they if they need to, they will just demolish the, these ghost towns and stop the, the property crash that way. Mm. Um, but they'll... So they'll never fall victim to the the, the idea because like I think it's I think it's since the nineteen eighties. Um Basically, when, when, when Thatcher allowed everyone to buy their council houses, then the, the amount of housing being built by the government has just fallen off a cliff. And that's created like a lot of, it's not artificial scarce, scarce, uh, scarcity, but it's like, it's scarcity. And then that's driven the prices up in, in a lot of ways. But do, yeah, well, I mean, you, could, you can disagree with that, but. I mean, when I was in Shenzhen, um, it's not just how much is built up, it's how much building is still taking place. Mm -hmm. Just like constantly every street has numerous construction projects on it and it really drives from the fact that we don't do that anymore that we have you know, planning permission and uh, all of these restrictions that make it difficult to build more houses it's the number one thing that could be do done to alleviate housing costs is just build more houses and we don't do it um, and as you say china does so mm. i mean do you so this this actually brings us nicely to, to like one of the other things i want to talk about so the the chinese uh it seems like they've they've basically like they've created the bubbles as you said and they've just like constantly pumped money into certain parts of the economy and it's like all just in a, a an absolute like don't let the growth run out sort of yeah it's like they're, they're turning the treadmill up and it's getting faster and faster and like like running to, to like make sure they keep going basically do you think that there are limits to to growth in 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 that sense at least do you think that like is it conceivable that they can just continue to like vastly increase the size of their economy? Like whether you believe that's artificial or, uh, artificial or not, they're, they're pumping the money in and it's work. It looks, at least it seems to have been working for the last little while in terms of like growing their economy, just like a, as a very broad measure of it. But is that, can that continue forever? Is it inevitable that that comes crashing down? Yeah. So, yeah well, it, it's mostly so far been what we would call catch up growth. So as John said, they're importing Western technologies and using this to grow at a rapid rate. That type of rate of growth, which, as you say, is completely unprecedented, um, isn't sustainable. I, I don't think, I think it's unrealistic that um, they would continue to grow at that kind of a rate. Um, whether they can continue to grow at all, it's... Yeah, so the, the Chinese economy between the late 1970s and 2010 was growing at an average of about 10% per annum. That's unprecedented in, in, in human hi history. And the amount of people brought out of poverty in China over that period of time, again, unprecedented in human history. We have never seen this. But even today, China is still a middle, what we'd call a middle income economy. Because if you take the, the gross domestic product, you divide it by the, the population, mm. it's still in the sort of the mid tier. It's at the upper end of that mid tier of economies. So it's not yet a, an economy that's kind of like an advanced economy. And also when you look at the urbanization of China, China's urbanization rate is 
between 50 and 60 percent today. Uh, you know, Western Europe, we were at that sort of level 150 years ago. So China's Whoa, got really? yeah. So China's got some way to go to reach the sort of levels of urbanization that we have uh, in, in the West today of about 80 uh, percent. So there's still room for growth uh, in, in China. Okay, because. I mean, I guess one of the, like, because uh, I spoke to um, Simon Ewell, who's from this group called Positive Money, um, and, well, no, the interview won't be out before this, but it will be out <laughs> for anyone watching. Uh, the Essentially, like, their thesis is that they want to take the money creation powers of quantitative, eas quantitative easing and then but like obviously not the monstrous amounts of money that get created but they want to try and use that in order to fund infrastructure projects like their 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 argument is that there is no utility to the wider economy by pumping money in at the top of the stock market because they, they argue that all it does is inflate asset prices and it doesn't trickle down to the real economy whereas if you invested it in for example infrastructure that it would create like a more broad-based economic growth or benefit. Uh, essentially, we, we had like about a 20 or 30 minute back and forth about um, the idea of growth um, and degrowth. And he his point was that like, are we, you know, if we're going to save the planet or if we're going to, you know, become sustainable, we can't keep growing. And my, my question is always, it's like, why does growth have to mean like destruction in a way or pl even like in a planetary sense like what it to me growth means that like we're we're making more stuff but that doesn't have to be like we're going to run out of physical things to make because you know the economy is going digital a lot you know there's no there's no limit to the size of the digital world and um i i always wonder because the, the the argument seems to be that like we're going to reach a certain point and then the growth has to stop or it has we have to become like we can't have gdp growth after a certain point and I, i've always found that to be a little preposterous and lacking imagination but like maybe that's just my <laughs> poor conception of it so so if you look at the again this is the beauty of looking at, at economic history and looking at the very long run so up until about 1750 across the world economies essentially didn't grow or if they did grow they grew at really really small levels so the absence of economic growth is what our ancestors lived with mm. and something happened around about 1750 or after and that was the industrial revolution all of a sudden we learned how to replace uh, you know, human effort with, with machines. And for the past 250 years, we've been continually doing that. And that's what's caused our economies to grow. Now, the question, of course, is can we keep doing that at the same rate? And there is a thesis out there that growth's running out. So if you look at the sort of productivity of, you know, Western Europe, of, of the UK, United States, it, it's, it's dipping. And the question is, can we keep growing? Can we keep finding these new, uh, you know, innovations, these new scientific breakthroughs that are going to make us even more productive. Mm. And if we can't find those, then we are potentially going to live in a world where there is low or, or, or no growth. And of course, for environmental reasons, people may want to select, uh, you know, as you know, we don't want to grow anymore because it's bad for the environment. And that, mm. of course, would be a political choice. Mm. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was always just a case of like, I didn't, I didn't see that growth couldn't mean like new sustainable forms of energy like that that it couldn't mean like ex like for more and more efficient like means of like using energy or whatever appliances we're making and that or like um biodegradable plastics and everything made of things that don't last a billion years and don't like uh break down like things like that i always just saw this as like i i feel like humans will always come up with new stuff as long as there is, as, as long as we haven't invented everything and like broken down the universe to its very basic components and gone well, yeah. that's everything. <laughs> I mean, I, I think what you're referring to is a sort of common fallacy that gets directed at economics for stating that there can be infinite growth on a planet with finite resources. That's not what growth is. You know, growth, um, if not infinite, can can go on for a very long time because. It, doesn't necessarily come from exploiting and consuming natural resources, um, but it's very theoretical. Um, we, yeah, we, we don't know how, how many more 
economically useful ideas that are out there or whether we're going to come up with them or whether we're going to run into a brick wall in the form of climate change or um, or anything else. So, um, uh, And the interesting thing is that the, the economic growth that we have seen has all come off the back of carbon. So the first industrial revolution generated by you know, steam engines, but that was coal. We then moved on to uh, electricity, which was like a major innovation, major general purpose technology, again, fueled by fossil fuels. And so it's carbon that really has transformed uh, you know, our economies and transformed people's lives. And I think sometimes we forget that, that these things have actually played a very useful role in our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was... Uh there's a couple of a couple of people that I've I've listened to that that are, have have pointed out is like right, it's like how do you meet because obviously the West has already or the developed world at least has already undergone like a big amount of of, of growth through the industrial revolution and and that a lot of uh, developing economies are yet to go through that period of development that that we've already been through. And um, they're always like, well, we've got to get them to care about the environment and do it sustainably. And I've heard the counter argument made that it's like, how do you get people to care about the environment? It's like when they reach a certain level of GDP, then then all of a sudden environmental movements start to spring up. Like, it's, I don't think it's a surprise that like that rural China or or Thailand or uh, parts of Africa say like Namibia don't have a strong green party presence <laughs> it's like you have to get to like a certain level of prosperity before you start to care about the environment because before that you just care about surviving mm -hmm. which is yeah i've always found that argument very very interesting and the best way to lift people out of poverty that we've discovered thus far has been consumer capitalism <laughs> in a way um it's it's lifted I think there's there's this fantastic statistic actually like really positive um people maybe don't see it as such but is that uh, i think in 2000 the un predicted um like the the absolute maximum number of people that we could lift out of poverty by 2020 and we beat it early like we which is just mind-blowing to me this is like how they said the best case scenario was this much and then we beat it and like a few years before we even got to 2020 for me that's like quite a positive thing i'm like wow okay yeah yeah so it really drives home how difficult the choice that we're really making you to say we need to move away from carbon consumption and create a, a, a global economy that's sustainable mm. is also saying that more people are going to remain in poverty um and yeah, I, I don't have an yeah, easy yeah. answer for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, say for some monstrous um, intervention that means that the, we or the developed world decides to invest like monstrously in giving sustainable tech to the developing world, but it's a very difficult to envision that happening as much as I would love it to be a thing. Yeah, even that's a long shot. We, we don't know if the sustainable tech is going to be there, but it is the only shot we have, I think, is invest very heavily in developing sustainable forms of energy and then give it away mm. so. yeah so um i think we're we're coming up on, a, on an so hour or so an hour. yeah so and I'm, I'm aware you've got a cooking class at five so um just to to sort of yeah finish up um is there anything you would like to plug and do you have predictions as to whether we are in a bubble and when it's all going to come crashing down uh, so I'd like to plug our book, <laughs> Start and Spoon and Bust the Global History of Financial Bubbles, and uh, don't buy crypto. <laughs> okay. And certainly don't buy Boom and Bust uh, with, with, with crypto. So it's, it's, it's out in paperback this month, uh, and uh, there's an audiobook available as well for those who, who like audiobooks. Okay. But thanks very much for having us. Yeah, not a problem. It was, uh, yeah, really, uh, really fun chat. Great to have you guys here. And um, links for the book will be in the description below. But uh, yeah, thanks very much, guys. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. That's a wrap. I felt that I was too far away from that mic. You were kind of looking at me coming closer. Yeah, I wasn't sure. To be honest, Blair's got the head. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate you tuning in and making it all the way to the end of the show. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.